And Alex is a visiting assistant professor at Whittier College. And her research focuses on plant hydraulics and water relations of both chaparral and coastal sage scrub systems. And today she'll be presenting work that she did as a postdoctoral fellow um, with Locretz at UCLA. Thank you, Alex. Can I, am I on the mic or? Okay, yeah, everyone can hear me, excellent. Um, so I also do research on plant hydraulics and water relations. So um, thank you, Erin and Dr. Davis for the intro. Um, normally I do focus on how chaparral and coastal sage scrub species um, respond to drought, but climate change is more than just drought. We're also going to have uh, warmer temperatures. And along with that, we're also going to have um, more extreme heat days. And so I became interested in this um, when I was doing my postdoc at UCLA. And so it was actually a side project um, that I did with Dr. Um, Uli Zeich there. So, um, so let's get into it. So you all know that California is a biodiversity hotspot. We have our Mediterranean type climate. And um, with our really variable um, rainfall that we have, this may lead to California being a climate change hotspot. So we have you know, some really wet years, we have some really dry years, we have acute drought, we have chronic drought, um, but some of these less favorable conditions may become more common in the future. So how are our native species, including chaparral, going to respond to these um, changes? So again, we've had great introduction to this. Um, and I should update that now um, to 2016. Um, but the, um, this paper um, looked at tree ring data in the chaparral. And according to their paper, the 2012 to 2014 drought um, was the worst drought in California in the past 1,200 years. So this image is from the US Drought Monitor um, out of California um, in 2014, um, which this um, paper included looking at. And the um, darker the colors, the worse that drought is. And at this period in time, um, about 60% of California was in that really dark red color. That's um, exceptional drought. That's the most extreme category. And um, the rest of the state was at least in um, some sort of drought at that period of time. So not only are we having these um, really intense drought situations, but it is predicted that heat waves are going to be more common in the future. Um, so the images I'm going to show you are from um, a paper um, where Dr. Alex Hall at UCLA was the PI, and they used a model to try to determine how many extreme heat days is Southern California going to experience by the end of the century. And they categorized extreme heat for our region as um, 35 degrees Celsius. So um, in this image, you can see um, there's Los Angeles, there's Riverside, Santa Clarita. And um, in the past, we had um, six extreme heat days a year. Um, you know, and, and, and that's not too bad for us to handle. You know, as people, we just go swimming or we turn on the air conditioner, but plants are sessile and they can't do that. And this is gonna be a problem because how many extreme heat days do you think we're predicted to have by the end of the century? You could just kind of take like a mental guess. Um, according to their model, they believe it's going to be 60 to 90 extreme heat days by the end of the century. Um, and so you can sort of see this depicted um, in the figure on the bottom, especially in our inland sites, um, it will be worse. And um, really what this is pointing to is, um, they call it this new season of extreme heat. So summer isn't just gonna be summer any longer, it's gonna be like extreme summer. Um, because this is going to be, you know, day after day after day of really hot temperatures. And so how are plants who can't move to escape this going to respond to this extreme heat? 
So that is the question um, of the study that we did. How do chaparral shrubs respond to extreme heat? So our first hypothesis, sort of the null hypothesis, is that um, chaparral shrubs would be unaffected. You know, there's it's this really resistant vegetation type, um, and they're just going to, you know, move ahead just like nothing um, is going to affect them. And so that would, um, we, if uh, that hypothesis was supported, we'd see no changes in um, carbon flux or um, water fluxes transpiration. Um, but an alternative hypothesis is that chaparral shrubs will shut down during these extreme heat waves events. And so um, what we would see in that situation is there would be declines in carbon gain and declines in water loss during these really hot days. Um, and this is the, what I expected to happen. Um, but another alternative hypothesis is that just like we sweat when it gets really hot, um, because when water evaporates, it carries um, away a lot of um, heat, uh, that's what our chaparral shrubs would do, is that they would, quote unquote, sweat during these extreme heat days. And so what we would expect to see under that situation is that um, water fluxes are increasing. So these were the um, sort of three hypotheses hypotheses um, that we had going into this study. And um, you've seen some pictures of um, the Santa Monica Mountains from Dr. Davis's talk. So this work was done at Stunt Ranch, which is a University of California Natural Reserve System site. Um, and there is also a public trail there. So if anybody ever um, wants to go hiking, you can. Um, and just on the other side of these mountains is, um, you know, Malibu and the Pacific Ocean. So if there is ever traffic on the 101, I would just have to hop on over and take PCH back. So, you know, real terrible drive. <laughs> um, I say that jokingly because it's beautiful. And um, we focused on three species, uh, Melasma lorina, which we just heard about, uh, very deeply rooted, Quercus agrifolia, coast live oak, um, and also Heteromeles arbutifolia, um, or toyum, is the common name. And this is more of an intermediate rooted species. And we chose each of these species um, for a number of different reasons. One of them was um, location to each other, because we had to have our, our equipment um, uh, near each other. So there were some practical reasons. Um, but also, these species do have different um, water statuses because of their suite of traits such as um, rooting depth, uh, rooting depth, excuse me, um, or vulnerability to cavitation. And so um, this is again water potential data um, on the x-axis. Uh, we're going down to uh, negative five and on, uh, excuse me, did I say x-axis? On the x-axis is time and on the y-axis is water potentials. And melasma is in blue, quercus is in orange, and heteromeles is in green. And again, you can see um, we do have a blip um, where in um, early October, melasma dips down to around negative two. Um, but that was um, you know, one measurement you can see over the course of the year. It maintains a very favorable tissue water status um, versus heteromeles um, is more resistant to cavitation or those air bubble um, formations. And so it can handle, you know, a more negative um, tension with it, within its xylem. So, you know, these species um, each has a different strategy. So how is each of these species going to respond to heat waves? So what we did, um, this was pretty cool, and I have to, again, credit Dr. Louise Zipe. She's a physicist, and so um, she's used these um, custom-built chambers before. Um, and the way they work is um, these are flow-through chambers that are measuring fluxes in carbon, uh, carbon uptake, and fluxes in water, so transpiration um, by the plant. Because you know, when plants open up their stomata in order to take in carbon dioxide and make sugars, just like um, when we open our mouths to breathe, we also have uh, water vapor on our breath. This is the same thing for plants. They open up their stomata and they lose water. Um, so what we did on each of our study species is we installed these plexiglass chambers. 
uh, this is my fantastic art <laughs> overlaid on the chamber. And um, I wonder if I put a mouse, will you see? Oh, here we go. Um, so we um, put our plexiglass chamber over a branch and uh, we sealed the chamber uh, on the bottom of the plant uh, with a Teflon skirt. And we installed um, this Swedish fan that has a really uh, high rate of speed. And what it's able to do is bring in um, fresh, cool air into the chamber, because you could imagine that sticking a chamber um, on the plant is going to heat it up. Um, so what this uh, fan does is brings in this fresh, cool air, um, you know, so our, our branches don't die, um, which we did have to worry about one time when a truck was speeding down um, one of the roads roads and they hit a light pole and our electricity went out. And so we were like, oh no, we had to uh, run over there um, and take the chambers off so our branches didn't die. And the reason we are able to know that happened is because um, all of our data is collected and uploaded to the cloud at the end of the day. So what's really great is I was able to be in my office and these chambers were collecting data for me. So that was rather luxurious uh, for me. That's not always the case. Um, but um, so each chamber, we also had a sensor that measured um, light that's used for photosynthesis. We had a sampling line that would measure the air inside the chamber and it would go to, excuse me, um, this instrument that would um, analyze it. Um, and we had a fan that mixed the air inside the chamber so that way you didn't um, accidentally sample a small eddy of air that happened to have high water concentration or happened to have low water concentration. Um, we also had thermal couples to measure leaf and air temperature. And again, all of this data um, gets uploaded to the cloud at the end of every day. So this is an example um, I'll walk you through. This is what a measurement cycle looks like. So um, we get one of these about every 15 minutes um, and we cycle through our three plants. So we have lots of data. We have two years of data sampled at every 15 minutes. So there's a lot going on here. Um, but what we first do in blue is um, measuring the air outside of the chamber and then measuring the air inside of the chamber because we want to make sure our chamber itself is not introducing um, you know, any artifacts. And so this is what we do. We see that the air inside the chamber, awesome. the air inside the chamber and the air outside of the chamber are the same. And then we turn that fan off. So um, fresh air is no longer being brought into the chamber. And you can see this on top is um, CO2 is being taken up by the plant. And so as CO2 is being taken up by the plant, the CO2 inside the chamber, the concentration is going down. And then we turn that fan back on and we make sure that the concentration of the air returns to what it was before and again, measure the atmosphere. Um, and so we, we see this carbon uptake and water loss um, by the plants and are able to um, use a model to turn this into measures of carbon and water fluxes for each of these plants. And again, this happens about um, every 15 minutes. So this is what a day looks like. This is also night because we get measurements at night. I don't have to be in the field at midnight right here, we're, we're getting data. Um, so at night, you know, there's no sunlight, so the plants are not doing uh, photosynthesis, so there's no fluxes going on. But then the morning, the sun comes out and the plants start doing photosynthesis, we get a nice morning peak. But then the middle of the day, you know, it's, it's really hot and the plants don't want to lose too much water. So you get what's called a midday depression. And then in the afternoon, you have a smaller afternoon peak, the sun goes down, no more carbon fluxes. Um, so we see this sort of um, pattern of a high morning peak, midday depression, and afternoon peak also reflected in our water fluxes. Um, but you do see differences between species, so melasma is in red and quercus is in blue. So let's get into um, differences before heat waves, during heat waves, and after heat waves. So this is um, data from the Stump Ranch Weather Station. And I should remember, you know, the screen over here, sorry to this half of the, <laughs> the room over there. Um, but what you're looking at in uh, red are maximum daily air temperatures. In blue is precipitation. And on this bo uh, the bottom figure is soil moisture. 
And so I uh, put this yellow line in right here, um, which indicates um, 35 Celsius. So that's sort of the threshold for extreme heat. And you can see we had a number of days where we um, had it you know, extreme heat. So for this talk, I'm just going to focus on the first heat wave of the season and then the hottest heat wave of the season. So some results. Um, the carbon fluxes are always going to be on the left and the water fluxes are always going to be on the right. And um, what you're looking at right here, this is a before. Uh, this is before a heat wave. We're getting a really nice pattern, um, nice carbon flux rates. Um, when we see this reflected in the water. Um, but during the first heat wave of the season, what we see is a change in this diurnal pattern. So we're only getting a morning peak of photosynthesis, and then the plants <coughs> shut down after that. They're not taking up carbon in the afternoon. But if you look at the water pattern, which is right here on the right, um, these plants are losing water all day long, and they're losing more water than they were during this very favorable day. Um, so this is uh, what's surprising to me, but it points to um, that second alternative hypothesis that plants are doing, um, they're sweating or they're doing latent cooling um, during these heat wave events. But then if we look, um, I believe this was only one day after um, the heat wave, excuse me, um, a few more days than that. Um, we do see a return of our pattern of a morning peak of photosynthesis, midday depression, afternoon peak, and again, a return of our um, uh, lower water fluxes. So this is a pretty rapid recovery um, after heat waves as well. And um, so overall, what we saw is a loss of this afternoon peak of photosynthesis, exceptionally high transpiration rates, but recovery once temperatures cooled. If we look at our hottest heat wave of the year, again, this is a before image where we are seeing our morning peak, midday depression, afternoon peak, also reflected in um, our water fluxes. But again, during heat wave events, we're seeing almost no carbon uptake. We get a really small bump um, in uh, carbon fluxes, but these plants are shutting down. But we're getting these really high transpiration rates. Um, and again, once temperatures cool down, we're returning to our pre-heat wave patterns. Um, so again, you can see the, the water fluxes are going down. Um, so what we are again seeing is almost no carbon gain during the hottest heat wave event of the year, um, but exceptionally high transpiration rates. Um, but diminished recovery. So something that we saw with each subsequent heat wave is that the um, absolute peak of carbon flux um, isn't as high every time. Um, and again, this is likely because soil moisture is being depleted as the season goes on. Um, so what can we draw? What conclusions can we draw um, from these patterns that we're seeing? Um, and again, I'm showing you two heat wave events, but we had about 16 heat wave um, events that we saw. Um, so what we found is that um, Photosynthesis is shutting down, so these plants are not taking up carbon, um, but we saw increases in water fluxes. So we're seeing evidence of latent cooling going on. Um, so what would be the role of this latent cooling? Um, so what we believe is going on is that this um, these high transpiration rates or this latent cooling is essentially protecting the photosynthetic machinery in the leaves um, because if the temperatures do get too hot, some of those enzymes could become denatured and then you wouldn't have recovery. So by sort of making this, I don't know if gamble is the right word, but um, you know, by losing a little bit of water up front when conditions are bad, um, they can return to their normal functioning once conditions become good. But the implications under a hotter and drier future um, are not so great because what that means is that um, if plants are relying on latent cooling, but if droughts 
um, are becoming um, more intense or lasting for longer, there might not be soil moisture available to support these high transpiration rates. Another implication is that if um, these uh, regions are going from six extreme heat days a year to 60 extreme heat days a year, there might not be time for recovery to happen. Um, so this is sort of this double-edged sword that some of our vegetation um, may, faced, uh, may face drought in conjunction with um, hotter climate in the future. Um, so I would like to thank my collaborators, um, Dr. Wu Sun, um, Alejandra, who was an undergraduate on this project, um, and Uli Zeit as well um, as other members in the lab who helped during my postdoc. Um, and that's my current email address if anybody just wants to shoot some questions to me. So thanks. So um, based on the um, the weather station data that we saw um, during the, the years that I showed you, most of our heat waves lasted about three days um, where they exceeded that 35 degrees Celsius. I think we had one period of time where it was five days. Um, and we had another period of time where it was like three days, one day of cooler temperatures, and then like four days of hot. So um, I predict that in the future with more heat wave days, that instead of having individual heat wave events, it may be a very prolonged uh, period of time where um, you don't get breaks between these hot days. You know, um, in the beginning of the season, it would take about one day and you would get recovery of these patterns. But towards the end of the year, our last heat wave was in September. Um, it was often taking a week for um, these patterns to return. So, um, you know, as the season gets um, warmer and drier, it takes longer to recover. So if we're getting more heat wave days, um, that spells bad news. That's an interesting question. So the question was, is there, um, correct me if I'm wrong, if there's an upper temperature limit um, for photosynthesis? Um, off the top of my head, I don't know of an, an exact number, but I know at this site, temperatures never exceeded 45 Celsius, like, you know, nothing like that. So um, that's, that's like way hot. Um, so I don't know, I haven't done temperature response curves, but that's something that's been um, suggested for these species. I don't know if um, Dr. Davis or Aaron, off the top of your heads, know. Um, plants, plants don't like temperatures above 40 degrees Celsius. <laughs> I don't think anybody likes temperatures <laughs> above that, so. So Joe Barry and his colleagues at Carnegie did the Death Valley expedition. And so you, you get up above like about 45, between 45 and 50, 52, 53 Death Valley. It denatures the protein, so it's a real abrupt drop. Okay. So you would probably see some real abrupt drop. Yeah. Okay. So very hot. Death Valley hot. <laughs> did you have a question? Oh, so uh, have you, uh, have you scaled this up at all to sort of look at so the question was, has um, this been scaled up yet? So we put these chambers on individual plants, but what would this mean for carbon gain on a regional scale? So we haven't done that yet, but that's what we would like to do. So one of the reasons we put these chambers in is because we couldn't do another method called um, eddy covariance. Um, with the mountains, you don't get what's called um, good fetch over there, so you, you can't do that. So, But that is the goal, is to um, scale this up to do um, uh, impacts on carbon and water budget, but we haven't done that yet. So. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Good question. Yeah, <laughs> waiting to be done. Why don't you take one more? And while you're okay. doing that, I'm going to be sort of monkeying around behind you a bit. No problem. <laughs> Um, so the question was, um, you know, what are some of the patterns that we see, you know, just seasonally, not during extreme heat days, but just during a normal September day, for example. Um, so we do see um, reduced uh, carbon fluxes as the season goes on. So if you um, look at, for example, the max carbon fluxes on a regular day, not an extreme heat day in May versus September, um, you definitely have lower um, rates during those later months. Um, and that's for a number of reasons. You know, at that point in time, you may have gone six or even nine months um, without any rain. So soil moisture um, is decreased. Um, but we have so much data. So we have a lot of um, questions. For example, how do these plants respond during Santa Ana wind events? Because we have data for that. How do these plants respond when it's very dry but not hot? Um, so, you know, we have um, a lot that we can do with this data set. So um, that's exciting, but um, hopefully that kind kind of answered it. But there's more we could look at. Yeah. That's great. Thank you, Alex.